Well, it's time to it's time to get started, isn't it? You're well? Good to hear, Gup. Other than puking from a shitty gingerbread house, very good. Oh, God, McKed, what have you gotten yourself into this time? And what are we about to get ourselves into this time? Okay, I'm trying to think the last time I sat down. What, what was the last TNO game I streamed? Last TNO series. It's been a while. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head. I think it was a. Uh, actually, Nat Soshikomi. With uh, old Ivan Sarov. And so, um. We literally set up, um. A national Bolshevik state, so it's not like we can do much worse than that. Well, we could, but we're not going to today. Um, because, you know, it's Christmas. I figure we might as well go with something a bit more wholesome. Comparatively, not the most wholesome in, you know, execution, but you know what? You take what you can get with TNO. So, we're hopping in, we're selecting a scenario. And we're heading to Russia today, boys. Namely, Samara. Bo born of hazy post-war plans, the Russian Liberation Army, or, or ROA, was envisioned as nothing more than a collaborator militia writ large. Led by General Vlasov and a collection of turncoat Red Army officers, the ROA was meant to help legitimize German control of Arke Muscovian until the Russians could be driven further east or exterminated. The West Russian War in the 50s changed all of this, expanded by the desperate Germans and deployed to delay the resurgent Red Army, the ROA thrived against all odds and soon found itself pushing east. By the war's end, Vlasov and his men controlled a power base beyond the Reich's grasp. Written off as a mutinous rabble, the ROA has spent the intervening years waiting. Some hope for redemption, the others merely await the opportunity to carve an empire in West Russia and beyond. And taking gifts for everyone, I have the idea of order the Communist Manifesto to ba balance out his theory. That's might be a funny joke. Let's go to Russia. Heck yeah, McKenna has the right idea. I'm not going to, but I, I think it's funny. I think you should go for it. I think he'd appreciate it. So we're playing as Samara, ladies and gentlemen. Gonna go go ahead and select our country. Take a bit of a bit of a look around. Um. Usually you see the AI do pretty well, Samar. So I'm am curious to see how well we can give a sh give a uh, we can do with it, how well we can play our luck. So let's go ahead and uh, check it out, shall we, ladies and gentlemen? Start her up. Um, Let's start the timer while we're at it, huh? Huh? And... Come on. Any second now, come on, you get it. Actually, it's only three bucks on... Amazon paperback. There you go. Get the Communist Manifesto, Gup. A actually, you can't have a Communist Manifesto. We're anti-communist. We get 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 that shit out of here. Get get the f get the fuck out of here, Gup. Yep, yeah, we we are the anti-communist. <clears throat> In the blaze days of a West Russian war. When it seemed like the Reich's hold on Russia was on the verge of slipping forever, the German High Command turned to desperate means to stave off the collapse of their front line. Drawn from a range of auxiliary colonel militias, uh, colonial militias of the Russian conscripts that were meant to police German-held Russia, the Russian Liberation Army, or ROA, was created. In propaganda, the ROA was depicted as a proud Russian army, fighting the Bolshevik menace of a West Russian Revolutionary Front. In desperation, the Germans even allowed the creation of the Committee for the Liberation of the Peoples of Russia, or KONR, as the embryo of a free Russian Republic that would rule over areas liberated by the German counteroffensive. Reality was much less flattering to the ROA, 
Its leader, Andrei Vasilov, a former Red Army general, was nothing more than a puppet of the Wehrmacht's high command. His officers were a disjointed bunch. Many were also captured Red Army officers, preferring to join the ROA than die in a German POW camp. Others were fascist emigres, joining the ROA on a great crusade to defeat Bolshevism. The common soldiers were desperate canning fodder, drafted at gunpoint by the Germans and sent to reinforce the most desperate sectors of the front. Far from being welcomed as liberators, Russian people caught in the conflict areas welcomed RA soldiers with rocks and insults. Despite all this, VRA pushed on. The soldiers fought with the energy of desperation and managed to help turn the tide in the sector around Samara. Soon, the ROA found itself beyond the German lines, freed from their former taskmasters. With the war winding down and the front in retreat, the Germans rode off their cannon fodder as mutinous Slav Untermensch. The new headquarters of the ROA in Samara were not spared any of the terror bombing campaigns that followed. Since then, the ROA has huddled in Samara, having traded one prisoner for prison for another. Unable to expand their area of control by the terror bombings and forbidden to go back home in the West, the common soldiers of the army have languished for the better part of a decade in their garrisons. The ROA's officers, meanwhile, have grown weary of the Slobes' indecisiveness. They argue for more decentralized leadership and for the abandonment of KONR's original democratic mission in favor of a continuation of ROA's junta. Using General Sergei Bunyachenko as their mouthpiece, the men of the officers' committee schemed to take advantage of Laszlo's apathy in old age. However, the officers are not all united in ideology. Quite a few have formed a, few, a uh, pro-democracy faction and argue that Slob's heir, as the chairman of KONR, should be Maleti Zikov, a former journalist that has maneuvered his way into being the chief propagandist of the ROA's regime in Samara. Zikov argues for the continued struggle to liberate Russia from Bolshevism as well as German oppression. In between this, many common soldiers and lower ranking officials have grown tired of High Command's bickering and seek to follow General Oktan's goal to use the ROA to build a strong fascist state and to enrich the soldiers in the process. The ROA is at a crossroads, loathed by all their neighbors as German collaborators, yet feared by, for their veteran army and iron discipline. The men of the ROA await the end of a terror bombing. Some seek to redeem their honor by rebuilding Russia. Others seek vengeance on the communists and on the Germans who have ruined their life. Finally, a growing minority simply want to lash out at the uncaring world that has forced them to lose a decade. Hold in Samara. And so let's check out, check out the features, huh? Determine who shall win the f power struggle to be the successor of La Sauve as leader of the ROA. Finish what the Germans could not do and finish the front once and for all. And then show the world the peril perils of underestimating the so-called traitor's dogs of the ROA. Onwards, shall we? Alright, so it looks like we got five divisions starting off. Uh, Field Marshal, we'll go with Sergei Bunyachenko. Very angry looking fella. On top of that, we'll go with uh, Fyodor Trukin, that infantry defense looks pretty nice. We'll go with him. And can we give him, we can give him infantry expert if we end up getting the command power. Beautiful. I'm already digging this. Oh my, okay. Um, our industrial base is kind of lacking. Sergei and Theodore, exactly. Um, our infrastructure game is kind of whack. Um, I'll build some here. Oh my god, our industrial base is fucking horrible. Ugh. No national focus set. Let's take a look at what we got. Hmm. Okay. Now let's do research real quick. Before I forget, a uh, new generation of... Actually, let's hold off on that. Computing machines. And then... Pr uh, probably construction. No, wait, industry. God, we don't even have basic industry. That's, that's fucking horrible. Wow. We're not in a good position right now. Okay, so we got reunification of Russia. From the provisional commissariat. Raiding and looting. We have smuggling operations, which are 
is our own uh, unique little mechanic. Many of Mikhail Oktan's men are notoriously corrupt, however they do get us the best gear. We could try to rid ourselves of them, but this would likely limit the amount of arms we could smuggle in from German Reich Komazarats. The situation in the Reich Komazarats is normal, 100% efficiency, corruption in our system is currently negligible, civilian morale is low, and military morale is low. Huh. Alright, well let's take a look at more of our situation. We have Lufama terror bombings, just general not good, uh, not good stuff. We have Ger the German bootlickers, Malice, which, wow. As much as we like to claim that we are a spearhead for liberation of Russia from under the red yoke of Bolshevism, everyone considers us an extension of German influence over the motherland and correspondingly hate us for it. Unfortunately, hatred by the Russian people does not correspond to love from our firm and Germ former German masters who have written us off as mutinous rabble. Not a good start. From here, we also have the Smolensk Manifesto. Proof of the ROA's legitimacy to a select few, and proof of their irredeemable treachery for all else. The manifesto was issued during the West Russian War, declaring the ROA's opposition to communism in Russia, and hopes for a new republic to replace the Soviet Union. Despite its creation by the hands of desperate German propagandists, the manifesto has remained a core component of our claim to legitimacy. So some stability, a hit to political power, bonus to, uh... Authoritarian democracy. Then we have German military training. Back when the ROA was a mere colonial militia, the Germans insisted on imposing military training and savage discipline onto their subhuman auxiliaries. The West Russian War saw their ar the army's numbers swell with the former Red Army veterans, and their metal tested in desperate battles. As such, the ROA is one of the few professional militaries in Western Russia. Then we have the Turncoat General. Our generals and officers share little in common beyond their past as German prisoners of war and a willingness to work with the Germans. Some were driven by a hatred of Red Army or anger at bad treatment, real or imagined. Others simply saw it as the way out of a prisoner's camp. No matter the reason, and no matter how skilled they are, our generals' treason to the Russian people makes them widely detested men. And then we have low military morale, which doesn't have a... Uh, Anything associated, it's just not good. Low civilian morale, also not good. Negligible corruption, that's actually pretty okay. All things considered, we, we actually have a, something uh, that's not horrible going for us. I'll take that. So we'll put these guys on the board with Kazan. And then we'll go and start up a focus, our guide. Actually, yeah. Actually, we'll, we'll, we'll read this and we'll check out our leader. As another year rolls on, our guide, Andre Vlasov, continues his Sisyphean reconquest effort. Whatever power he gathers, his underlings steal. Whatever legitimacy he possesses, the German bombings strip away. The sad man grows older, buried under the weight of history and the judgment of those outside his borders. Yet he has not given up. For the coming trouble of Germany may signal his one last chance. For now, his greatest quality is that he is able to maintain a coalition. The various generals like him better than they like one another, and the people have found his rule fair if not particularly noteworthy. There are worse places in Russia than Samara, certainly, but if Vlasov is to serve as a guide to a renewed Russia, he must begin anew his consolidation of military and popular support. All right. So let's take a look at our leader, Andrei Vlasov. The very name of Andrei Andreevich Vlasov, the turncoat Red Army General, remains a sensitive topic for many Russians. To his few supporters, Vlasov is a modern-day Ivan Kalita, a visionary ruler who wisely submitted to a military superior conqueror. Then used their patronage to gain a foothold in a powerful and independent Russian state in the future. For most of a former Soviet citizen's hour, his name is associated with the most heinous betrayal comparable to that of Judas. Of course, the real character of Lasov is far less poetic than that. It's hard to say whether the disgraced general was driven by a sincere desire to pierce the Red Menace with German bayonets, or a simple urge to survive when he allied himself with the Nazis. But whatever motive he had, the German High Command never considered himself a noteworthy ally, only allowing him to silently gaze upon his country being trampled behind the German boot from well behind the front lines. 
the last chance for Lesov to redeem himself, both in the eyes of the Germans and the eyes of the Russian people, appeared during the West Russian War when his Russian Liberation Army helped turn the tide against the West Russian Revolutionary Front's offensive. Even though it was Lesov who helped beat back the Soviets, obtaining his own domain in Samar into the aftermath, the Germans still saw him as little more than a dog to be kept on the short chain and closely watched. Humiliated by his masters and unpopular among his war once trustworthy officers, who have started to view his servile demeanor as an obstacle to liberating Russia, Vlasov remains a weak and isolated figure who can only hope that reclaiming Russia will absolve his miserable title of a loathsome traitor. We can hope. Funny spirit voice. Somebody said the funny spirit voice! Are you happy with that? I need some water after that. Funny. There we go. <sighs> yeah, man, we are not in a good position. I'm already noting, noticing. Jesus. Ah. Uh. Reich's last conquest. Well, Shiza. Our guide. The Sov's aides walked constantly to and fro the old man's office, the tidal nat nature of their movement echoing the old man's current situation. Even in these desperate times, few could stomach working directly for the traitor general himself. Those that managed to either ignore or muster indifference towards the accusations against the Sov found themselves buried in drudgery, bored out of their wits instead of merely disguised by the stench of treason. Better, perhaps, to pray for an assignment on the border. Instead, were death and starvation dispelled the lethargy. Vlasov stood on political quickstand, his position shifting and changing by the day, but never improving. Some of his aides suspected that the old man would have preferred being genuinely hated by his generals instead of their current indifference. In the college of traitors that felt the Iroquois upper echelon, Vlasov was not particularly liked, but nor was he disliked. Whatever coalition or common ground he tried to build usually disintegrated within the month. But if the old general cannot be liked by everyone, he could at least try to gin up love and hatred within specific factions. Under him, Zakob's Democrats constantly agitated against Okhtan's war profiteers. In between, schemed the officers' committee, General Bunyachenko, their puppet. Vlasov long pondered on which faction to cast his full and hollow weight behind. His remaining scraps of authority would tip the balance. Now that time, now that time for a decision had come, the general's own aide could scarcely guess which side the Slav would choose, nor how the Arway's future would play out as a result. The traitor general is not yet done. Sitting behind side the ruin of a hut, Sasha struggled in an attempt to hear her companions. She'd lost an ear to the shrapnel of the bomb that destroyed the structure, and with only one remaining, she was having difficulty determining exactly where sounds were coming from. Scared and alone, she wanted nothing more than to once again hear the laughter and banter that had so often occupied both the structure and fire pit outside it. The laughter that would always follow a long day of hunting and tracking, where she would be congratulated by the hunters for expertly leading them through the dense bush. Sasha waited there all day, confident that the hunters mu would, must, return. She'd always been faithful to them, and could not fathom the idea that they w shouldn't, would not show faith in return. Evening came, and she remained, curling up as much as possible for warmth. Night fell, and she remained, watching the curious eyes of many other predators inspect her from the tree line. When the morning arrived on the second day, hunger came with it. Sasha knew her friends were not coming back, that there were no reason to stay here any longer, and she needed to hunt besides. But she had not forgotten her friends, and she knew that wherever they were, they could not have forgotten her. Sasha knew she had to go find them, and so she stood on all, f all fours and began walking towards the tree line. A day in the dog's line. Jesus Christ, man, I'm fishing and then I get ear raped by an imposter with an accent. Hey, man. Someone asked for the funny spear voice. I, I, I gotta, I gotta oblige. Um, I'll pause. It's a calm enough event so you can read it. Interesting story, if nothing else. Um, let's go with our voice. Our consolidation effort goes through Mileti Zykov. 
Sokov was difficult to describe, for much of his past was cloaked in mystery. Few claim to know where he comes from. The man himself claims to have been a leading ideologue in the opposition of the Soviet government, and he's indeed shown himself to be a highly talented public speaker and propagandist. His efforts to reach out to the people of Russia in general, and Samar in particular, have done much to generate what few shreds of good reputation we possess. Sokov is among the greatest advocates of freedom and democracy in our officer corps, and has built himself a small clique around this position. His aim is not merely to free Russia, both from warlordism and from Germans, but to bring forth a new, carefully supervised democracy. To many militarists in our government, he is a soft man. To German loyalists, he is a decadent parasite intent on betraying our German benefactors. Few are sure where Zykov comes from, and few can claim to know his real endgame. But at the critical juncture, his skills and propaganda are irreplaceable. We need his voice as the Army of Liberation marches onwards. So we'll get some more infantry equipment coming up, actually. Ooh. Okay. Armaments Factory Number 14 was a small complex near the Samara Rail Yards, repurposed by the ROA itself. During the darkest day of the terror bombings, a small shack was soon built up, the factory. In reality, little more than a large building with a few log long wooden tables and a small number of machine tools was decided to taking part German small arms and reverse engineering them for our own purposes. The Sov and most of the O's under him knew that their German support would eventually run out, and they had long made provisions to ensure that their myriad of German equipment from car 98Ks to STG-44s would remain operable even once it was no longer possible to receive their parts from their former benefactors, now they're officially nor through smugglers. The factory rarely worked during the day, the bombing made it too hard to, but workers toiled at night with small headlamps and minimal light, disassembling old or world-worn rifles and their respective ammunitions. These workers, despite their rugged conditions, were not civilians, not officially at least. They were engineers, not just employees of the IRA, but members of it and experienced in handling German weapons for many years. Until recently, the factory had been minimally staffed. However, with the increasing amount of bloody victories run by the ROA, the soldiers at the front lines needed more and more weapons, and the number of those who can get from German smugglers has become minuscule compared to our needs. As such, Armaments Factory Number 14 has, as of recently, expanded not only in terms of manpower, but location as well. A number of shyly constructed buildings have been added to the original to form a sort of complex, where dedicated stations and senior engineers act as efficiency generating machines as a late the factory was no longer just reverse engineering weapons but producing their own versions of them certainly not w with the workmanship of the originals they were cheap and easily produced and that's what the hike man wanted the beast of the industry rears its beautiful head there we go beautiful more guns more stuff to reinforce always good right about now i'll take that our manpower is horrible we have 67 men in our manpower reserves. Oh, we have 110 now, okay. Still, that's not good. We're gonna need a lot more than that. Um, that the German bootlicker thing is really kicking our ass. One of the oddest phenomena on the territory controlled by the ROA was a small train about an hour's march from the city of Samara. Previously a small stop from West Russia to the city, the station's real name had long been replaced by another. The contraband station, as it was now known, was one of the last stops for German smugglers, or Moscovian garrison members, who were paid too little to justify the risk they took. These smugglers, who brought with them just about anything a Russian soldier could dream of, made lucrative deals for local garrisons to sell them anything from tobacco and tea to chocolate and small mementos. Any luxury products that managed to trickle their way down to German-occupied Russia were made available to the RA soldiers. It was one of the largest benefits to signing with the RA. Simply put, their old contacts with the Germans had allowed them to afford a few more luxuries than their ideological rivals. As both German and Russian worked to offload goods from the train, they chatted with one another in broken fragments of their respective tongues, each side having made clear efforts to learn the other's language. One of the Russians asked a German about his family. I don't know, honestly. He responded, They're back in Prussia. I've heard that there's not much in the way of work, but other than that, there's been no word. The German one could be courteous, responding kind. What about here? What's life like in Samaro? The Russian chuckled a bit. I wouldn't know. I haven't seen the city in weeks. This is my first time being remotely close to it. Border patrols, skirmishes with bandits. I'm sure you're familiar. 
Contraband Station was an incredibly strange site for cultural intermingling. The Russian soldiers didn't like their German counterparts who supplied the contraband, and they were confident that the Germans felt the same about them. And yet, the Russians attempted to learn German, and the Germans tried their hand at Russian. Everyone knew each other's names, food was shared, and jokes were even made of a language barrier and repeated communication at times. Ultimately, both sides were a part of each other's lives, and both accepted that fact, even if they didn't like those that the fact was made up of. A strange glint of humanity in the Stark Land. Oh, that's kind of nice. Our voice. Next, we'll go ahead and go with our general. There's a theory. There is, in theory, a hierarchy to the National Liberation Army, with a sove at the top and a range of officers neatly arrayed below him. In practice, however, the opinion of the officer corps in a whole is critical to our endeavors. And the officer corps and his committee is a champion in Sergei Bunyachenko, a former Soviet officer. Bunyachenko was captured by the Germans in the Second World War and thrown into a penal colony for his troubles. Fear in Russia mourned his fate, as he was widely blamed for by the Soviet leadership for losing several critical battles in the opening stage of a war. In the dark days of the West Russian War, Bunyachenko was offered a way out of his jail sentence, joined the Russian Army of National Liberation, and pushed the front back. Angry at the Soviet leadership and desperate to leave his prison, Bunyachenko agreed and quickly rose through the ranks of a National Liberation Army. Bunyachenko is widely seen as a capable officer, beloved by the men for standing up for their ideals. The general cares li for little but the reunification of Russia, the annihilation of a Soviet remnant, and most of all, the downfall of Germany. Sounds kind of based. <clears throat> welcome, welcome. Zikov had his bodyguard usher in Vlasov's aide, firmly holding onto the general's package. It's good to see you. We never hear enough from the commander Vlasov. The ever-energetic propagandist of the IRA held a hazy position in the army's leadership. While not officially on the officers' committee, Mileti Zikov had warmed his way into a comfortable office in Smar's principal headquarters. Supporters of his faction could be seen screaming in and out at various times. A few stacks of pamphlets rested on the office's varied furniture. Zikov almost yanked the package from the aide. Aide's hand, after his swift introduction, began leafing through it, whistling all the while. Huh. Interesting. Interesting. Were well, the propaganda's only comments. For his trouble, Basov's aide was giving a new package. Bring it to your boss, alright? Zikov said, with a characteristic cheer. Moments, of li moments later, the aide found himself escorted back outside. A stream of visitors had brought even more officers to the quarter, all waiting for a chance to speak with Zikov. None of them appeared too surprised to see one of Slob's own aides coming out of the office, expecting the commander to keep in touch with his own prime propagandist. Still, some looks followed him through the corridor, with Zakov's voice ringing out from behind closed doors. <sighs> Menshikov, you handsome bastard! What's the news? Does Zakov's energy know no bounds? I don't know, but all I know is that I'm getting some political power from it, so he can have... as much enthusiasm as he needs to. Um, anything we can do right now. Uh, we can invest in infrastructure, but there's no apparent gains. Um, all right, let's get going. So we have two pretty solid victory points in Samara and Stravnopol na Volga. Oh, we can go ahead and uh, what do we want to do? Agriculture methods, probably a good idea. How is our trends? I mean, oh god, our poverty rate is worsening. So is our academic base. We can't do anything about our poverty rate for a good long while. Academic base is probably going to need to be the next thing we go after, though. Widespread cronyism. Which is actually... If I'm not mistaken, it's better than your typical... And actually, I think it's just about the same military training-wise. Freedom of manufacturing, 50-80% poverty. Not good. Let's go ahead and check out their puppet. 
Mikhail Lokdan is a hard man to his supporters, and a broken man to the others. He has little sympathy for the communist regime, defeated twice in 15 years by the Germans. He's not a monarchist or a democrat, for the weakness of these past regimes has brought Russia into the shackles of a failed communist regime. Hmm. The Germans have become the masters of Europe, and what of it? For Octana supporters, Berlin has crushed every Jewish regime that had obscured man's progress. The slow and his ilk might see the Germans as the means to the end, but Octan knows better. He sees the Slov as a broken, pathetic man squirming to get out from under the German shadow. Mikhail Octan is happy to collaborate with Germany. He sees no greater purpose than helping to enforce the German will upon the ruins of the Soviet Union, and his eager collaboration has left him secure your many contacts in Orkay Muscovian and beyond. Mikhail Oktan may be a hard man or a broken man, but he is certainly a dangerous man, and an essential one, for through him Samara secures essential supplies for, from the German ogre. Huh, nice guy! Yeesh. It was unusual for Binashenko to receive private delivery messages. Usually, the officer committee read and responded to all of the Slopes communiques, leaving Bunyashenko not particularly involved in the day-to-day -day operations of a faction he normally led. Hence, how surprising it was for him to bother reading the Slopes communications. The general locked the door behind the aide before sitting back in his room. The room was austere with no luxury other than a small furnace in one corner. The aide waited as the general read through a few of his sets of documents. One paper in particular gave the general pause. The aide recognized the Slopes' signature at the bottom. Bunyachenko read the letter a few times before strenly looking up. <sighs> Who else knows the contents of this bundle of documents, soldiers? Only I am the slope, sir. Good. You're dismissed. Bunyachenko crumpled the letter in a ball and threw it in his furnace before unlocking the door. Like that, the aide found himself back in the corridor, empty save for that faint sound of fire, consuming. Special correspondence between Bunyachenko and Vlasov? Hmm curious. Could focus on research. I think I'm good for now. I think I'll save up some PP. Oh. A slight breeze blew through the city of Samara as Simeon patrolled the city. A sharp eye trained on a passerby. Some of them glared at him and impotently, some of whom just tried to avoid attracting his attention, which didn't matter to Semyon, as long as we didn't try anything funny. Hey! Hey, Semyon! Semyon, over here! Semyon turned to face the source of the voice, and an eyebrow rose in annoying surprise at the face t running towards him. Ah. General Bunyachenko ordered that no soldier patrol alone for the time being. One of our own got badly beaten by dissidents. I volunteered to join you, seeing we're old friends. Fyodor explained, having no way of knowing their friendship was not mutual. As we began to walk toward, together, despite Simeon's reluctance, Fyodor lays topic conversation got Simeon's interest for once. By the way, Simeon, I've been thinking about this for a while, but don't you think it's weird? Bunichenko's a Ukrainian, yet he's prominent over here instead. Frowning, Simeon scratched his head, chin in confusion. What's so odd about a Ukrainian Russia? Well, it's, it's not just him, Fyodor quickly assured him. Old man Kromiadi's a Greek from down the Caucasus, and Bayersi's a, is a genuine Pole. Fyodor's voice grew hush. No one really knows anything about Oktan either. There are all kinds of rumors swirling around about him. Most common seems to be that he's a Croat or a Serb, something like that, and the son of a Balkan baron. Then there's Zykon, who admits he's Ukrainian and nothing else. I've, I've heard a few rumors that he's a Jew, but before he could get anything out, Fyodor m found his mouth covered by Simeon's hand. It'd be a lie to say that he liked the annoying gossip at all, but just hearing something like that could put his people in danger. Fyodor, perhaps it'd be wisest if we moved to another topic conversation. With a withering glare from Simeon, the rest of the patrol was conducted in silence. Some stories are best left undiscovered. Hmm. Interesting stuff. What 
do we got to do now? Any looting? Not quite yet. Timer back out. <clears throat> Harvest days was what they were called around these parts. RA soldiers would descend upon the towns in her full battle dress, proceed to help the local farmers with their harvests, providing the valuable manpower that their fields needed, especially since so many of her sons had been conscripted or killed. When the harvest days had first been put in place, there was little trust or goodwill between the soldiers and the villagers, especially considering one of the reasons the soldiers helped out with harvest was to take some of their food back with them. But as the harvest days became more regular, and the villas became more acclimated to the presence of the RA, they began to see them not as German collaborators, but as protectors. The atmosphere changed. Trust was built between civilians and soldiers. Eventually, some members of the RA even began volunteering for the harvest days, usually conscripts who had a background in agriculture, hoping to be assigned to one. With some of the friendliest villages even offering to feed the soldiers during the day, it was a relatively comfortable assignment compared to border patrol or anti-band operations. While the Committee for the Liberation of the Russian People was far from popular, they had been working hard to secure the regime, distance themselves from the Germans, and even improve their relations with those they ruled over. These harvests were a key part of that, and they contributed to the image that the ROA was there to help, not hurt. To a large extent, it seemed like they were working. No one liked taxes, especially when they were being extracted in the form of food, and oftentimes after the harvest, many of the farmers would stare jealously at the ROA's trucks as they pulled away from their village, wishing they had been able to keep more of the food they had grown. However, on the whole, it was a positive experience. The soldiers had even been effective in getting a few of the local boys in Russell's farmings to sign up for the ROA, which further helped dissipate tensions with the locals. Most of the core of the ROA had no local ties to the area around Smar, and having patrols protect those that they knew was a huge boon for KONR's propaganda machine. Now, where did I put my sickle? I think industrial investments are the way to go, because our industry is garbage. My god. Hmm. I think it, it never ends, does it? At unpredictable intervals, the planes arrive overhead. Sometimes their destination is further into the Russian interior, at others, however, they loop over Samar to drop their payloads, screaming into the air. Its frequency left unpredictable, no one can get used to the random terror bombings. They can merely be endured. And yet the winds of change may still be blowing. Were Germany to fall, into trouble of its own, perhaps these might be the last months of the accursed terror bombings. As such, an officer's conference has been gathered to discuss how best to prepare for the upcoming window of opportunity. Various factions made their case of the slope and the officers. In the meantime, regular salvaging efforts continue. Buildings torn down by the war machine seek their components moved to new places. Supply convoys use as target practice are pushed out on the road so that others may pass. Life in Russia goes on. Vassalov's aide was guided into Okton's office by two stern bodyguards. Their boss sat behind an office, reading reports and documents from their border, from across the border within the Reich in between puffs of smoke. Ever genial, the general stood up to greet Vassalov's envoy with a handshake. Can I in invite you to indulge in some tobacco? Fresh arrival from our western neighbor. What are the odds I get a kiss on the lips? Uh, ask me tomorrow. How about that? The aide glanced at the box of empty rolled cigarettes. How are you doing, by the way, Flair? Nice to see you. It had been so long since he last had a proper smoke. The thought of owing something to Octon, however, no matter how insignificant, gave the aide some pause. Still, good tobacco was good tobacco. Thank you, Commander. The aide played... Eased on Oktan's desk the package he had been tasked to bring and help himself to a few cigarettes. Oktan smiled. I've heard, good, heard things about you, soldier. If you ever find yourself looking to carry out a couple of favors, please come visit me. I've no greater concern than the, my men's quality of life. Tempting off for sure, the aide nodded again to Oktan and followed the guards back outside. One of them offered him a, ra a light. The aide walked back to the soldier's office, savoring the rare pleasure of good tobacco. It had been months, if not years. Perhaps owing Oktan is not so bad after all. Pretty good, how was your Christmas? It was alright. 
Ooh, we got some manpower. That's very nice. Um, that's yeah, not bad. I enjoyed it. Good all I'd say so. I got uh, some pretty, pretty dope vinyl, which I'm happy for. Um, a lot of Frank Ocean bootleg, unofficial. Um, still need to listen to it to check the quality of it, but I mean. It beats paying fucking 500 bucks for one. Any good socks? Oh, I got a few. I got a few, McKed. Asking the real questions, of course. Can I scavenge for loot? Not quite yet. Oh, let me try to pull up the socks. Um. There we are. What kind of man do you take me to be? I'm not getting these socks crust crusty. Why would you think why would you say such a thing? Alright, uh, let's get back to it. It never ends. I'm guessing sick emotes. Thank you. Thank you. Right, have you been on since I added the emotes? Fly I forget. Uh, we can check what is ours. Hmm. Didn't get any socks, but I got some hand socks. There you go. There you go. You have them. They're sexy. I agree. I, 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 the emotes are good. Um, what do we want to do? We got to decide what path we want to go down. We can either go the democratic route. They're vaguely democratic. We can go fascist German collaborator or we can do the despot military path. And I've done a lot of democracy games, so I game, so I want to mix it up and do something kind of different. So I want to cross this out. This one is just a bit much. It's hard to find gloves for my hands, but my fingers are normal length, but super wide. Ooh, hmm. Change it up. Yeah. So I think what we're going to do, we're going to go with the military path. Uh, with, uh, I believe Bunyachenko leads that one. So we're going to take what is ours. Bunyachenko and a sizable faction of the officer corps have rejected Zakob's ideas of sparing the population further taxes. It's unfair to soldiers to risk their life and live on steel rations as the people of Samara live in peace and quiet. The citizens must be better integrated into our government structure to enable them to give their fair shake. They've had the luck of being among the first to be liberated by the KONR, and they should be aware of us. Punyacheco's plan is with us organize a detailed census. Once the population of every village and community is known to us, we can begin estimating how closely the sheep can be shorn without injuring them. This is a big undertaking and will occupy most of our soldiers, as well as all of our men, with accounting skills. But the reward will well be w worth it. I trust that. I don't know, what, what, what else did you, what did you guys get for Christmas? Anything good? Hmm. Uh-oh. Shit. We're doing good stability-wise, too. The planes had come during the early morning supply run. Local peasants carrying bags of flour into the pantry disappeared in a cloud of smoke and debris. By the time the soldiers had dug them out, two had already died, crushed by falling debris. The finer survival's left leg had been reduced to pulp by the building's collapse. Outside, his relatives wailed at the men of the ROA, dragged out the unconscious body. The poor bastard was placed on a cart, his family given a few bags of food to help cushion the loss of a working-age man. The garrison's captain reviewed his troops as they continued digging out the pantry and salvaging as much food as possible. One recruit, a young lad from the nearby village, looked particularly grim as he shoveled bits of concrete out into the yard. <sighs> One of the long-faced soldier. It's not the first time the Germans bomb us, yes? The young man paused and saluted the officer stiffly. Sir, um, uh, speak. Uh, it's just, uh, sir. The, the men of the village, they said the... Our way had a deal for Germans, uh, sir, that their bases were not bombed. The officer laughed. <laughs> Is what that what they say in whatever shithole we drag you out of? That the Germans have an ounce of mercy? That we give a shit about their old conscript army? Uh, ye yes, sir. Well, there's your answer. The officer gestured towards the collapsed building where the other officers were pretending to work. 
there's the answer for all of you. The ROA has got nothing but what we can get ourselves. Now get back to work. At this pace, your dinner will mold under this pile of concrete. Sir, yes, sir. Let's see, I've got some summer sausage, cheese crackers, and sweet hot mustard, some hoodies, and more Bob Ross puzzles. That's really about. That's not a bad haul. Shit. I'd take that. I mean, Bob Ross puzzles? Oh, that sounds fucking great, dude. Huh. <sighs> I, I, I take that. That's a good haul. Scavenge for some more loot. And then take what is ours. Increase military morale by a small percentage. A knock came at Lasalle's door. And he looked up from his paperwork, letting out a long sigh. Only one person was scheduled to be seeing him about now. It was time, then, for the meeting with that man. <sighs> Come in, he told the visitor reluctantly. In walked Zimitri Zakutni, that infuriatingly, infuriatingly smug smirk of his still present, is still present on his face. I've come to give my advice on the development of industry, sir. <sighs> God, will Sov wish he could wipe that smirk off his face just once. Unfortunately, he had ties with Octan, but Vlasov doubted that even that man held any love for Zakutni. Nobody did. They'd all defected, of course, but Zakutni jo had joined their side without hesitation, eagerly even, and without an ounce of reason for it, being ideal ideological. He had just thought himself too good for a POW camp. A true coward among an army of cowards. Yes, continue, Vlasov finally said, as Zaktuni discussed his plans for the de development of defense against German bombings and increased armament production, Lasov barely listened. Knowing his disapproval approval or disapproval of the plan mattered little in the grand scheme of things. However, when Zaktuni began speaking about how it was only natural that such a great plan was devised by such a brilliant mind such as his own, Lasov couldn't help himself from slamming his fist down on the desk and standing up, shooting a seething glare towards Zaktuni, causing the man to take a couple, a couple steps back. You, as almost as quickly as he given up his given into his irritation, Vasov cooled down. Shouting at Zaktuni wouldn't change anything, except maybe for the wars. He had to keep his cool. It was the only thing of real value he still had left. <sighs> Sorry. Please leave me for be for the day, Zakutni. With a hurried apology and thanks, Zakutni nearly ran out of the room, shutting the door behind him. Sitting down again in the seat, Vasov let out a note long sigh. Had he really given up so much for this? Man. The border of Samar was usually quiet. In the off-season where the constant small-time raids and warfare of the Russian anarchy simmered down, men could be seen discussing with fellow soldiers from across the border. So it came that a few so it came that a few riflemen of the Russian Liberation Army came to drink in a small village of contested area. When men of the Imperial Army entered, there was a momentary tension. That too died down as the Vlasovites offered a round of drinks to the Imperials. Talks ebb and flowed on a range of topics, particularly violent group of bandits that both groups of soldiers had fought with, the bastards. The recent weather, mostly bad. The news from beyond the Urals, very confused. Eventually the topic moved to the front. A few veterans of both groups had fought in their 50s, and in the 50s. After commiserating on the shame of fighting fellow Russians to defeat the Reds, the soldiers shared war stories back and forth. A few more rounds were shared. The casual conversation marked the high point of the evening's mood. Eventually, a bitter dispute erupted as to the legitimacy of the ROA. Had not been as a German militia, dogs for the invaders, the ROA veterans snapped back that the Tsar had been invaded by the Germans, and that the white soldiers should not talk about serving tyrants, foreign or domestic. The barmen did not speak. Business was good for now. When these idiots started fighting again, the bar might have to move once more. Such was life in the Russian anarchy. 
Last call.